In my last two years at Rockefeller, we looked at the Fortune 500, and um, only 5% of the companies in the Fortune 500 are led by women. Um, and that number mm. has, pre women have come and women have gone, but it's sort of 23-ish to 25-ish at any particular time. We decided, again, I'm a research psychologist, so I decided to look at the data. We decided only to look at media, both print and, and other media sources, not social media, um, in a variety of ways, comparing women and men. So we found some extraordinarily interesting mm. things. When women CEOs were appointed, in 78% of the articles they talked about their family, um, a variety of personal, often their appearance, never is that in an article about a male CEO. In 40% of the cases in which women were appointed, they were appointed when the company was in crisis. Um, a much, I think it was 20%. I wondered if you were on the Uber CEO list. God, God no. <laughs> I wouldn't touch that one. And then, really interestingly, when a woman failed, she was personally blamed hmm. um, in the media. It wasn't her company, it wasn't whatever the issues, you know, bad economic market, bad products, whatever far more significantly than men, and most significantly, there's never been a male CEO, a female CEO in a large, in corporate America, um, who's been fired, who's been hired as a CEO again. Mm. And that number is significantly higher for men. So, well, it has to be higher than zero. Um, so, <laughs> there, there are a variety of ways in which these issues are still, and need to be, still front and center. So I end this by just how I felt as the first woman Ivy president. I was almost the first everything at Yale that I did, and, and certainly. Were you ever forward. nervous? <laughs> I was always nervous. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it, the goal is the goal that Ruth Bader Ginsburg articulated which is that it will no longer be notable. And then you will know that it's real. And I think we're not there yet.